All right. Well, I've got the top of the hour, so let me begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see you here today. We have a special session this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to where it goes. And this is an unusual session. The typical Future Trends Forum event uh, brings one guest on here to talk about one particular topic involving the future of higher education. But sometimes we experiment and we do something strange and different. One thing we've been doing is having a simulation exercise where for the hour, we all role play some position in a scenario which is given. And we've done a few of these scenarios in the past. Last week, we did a scenario about what might happen to higher education if Donald Trump wins the 2024 presidential election. This is a very energetic scenario. Lots of stuff happened. I post about this on my blog. You can learn a great deal about it. It's very exciting, very challenging. Now, this week, we're running that same scenario exercise model, but with a different outcome. We're going to assume instead that instead of Donald Trump winning, that's going to be Kamala Harris winning. Now, let me explain just really quickly how this works. And this has an unusual amount of slides, by the way. Uh, in fact, here, um, I, I often apologize for using slides, but these are a good way to organize and show you what's going on. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do is, for the next hour, make sure that you role play in your current role. If you're a librarian, a professor, a president, or a student, or if it's a role that you're trying to get into for the next year. So if you're a professor trying to become a dean, for example, if you're a student hoping to get a job in the library, play that library role, play that dean. Second thing is, you need to think about this in terms of practicality and vision. So think about how the scenario would impact you and yours in very practical, technical, detailed way. But also think about the big picture, what this means for society, what this means for higher education. And also, I feel like a Dalek saying this, collaborate. Please collaborate with your, with your fellow scenario denizens. Uh, share your thoughts and resources, because this is a complicated, big, big picture with a lot of stuff going on. And just one caveat. This is going to be a challenging one. There's going to be some scary stuff in here. So I'd just like you to buckle in and be aware of that. And if this at any time becomes too intense, shoot me a note or feel free to log off. I understand. All right. Uh, and hello, Christians in uh, New Hampshire. Very good to see you. All right. Well, here's what I'd like to begin with. This first half of the scenario uh, takes place a week and a half after the election. And it takes place, but well, what seems to have happened is that Kamala Harris has defeated Donald Trump by a pretty narrow margin. You can tell by looking over this map, uh, some red states stayed red, red blue states stayed blue, but a few of the blue states, or sorry, a few of the battleground states tipped blue, uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, for example, uh, Nevada, just enough to tip things over uh, to a Democratic victory. Now, let me just break this down to some detail. And again, think, this is you know just a week and a half after the election. Uh, on the day of the election, on the afternoon of the election, Donald Trump declared victory unilaterally on his own. Uh, just claimed that he had won straight up and it was time for him to re-inhabit the White House. Uh, about several days afterwards, the opposite verdict came out. Uh, there was a complete consensus of all news media, again, primarily television, but also uh, New York Times and some online sources that Harris had actually won uh, based on the count. And the Harris campaign declared victory on November 8th. Uh, meanwhile, in the Congress, the Republicans won majorities in the House and Senate. The Senate majority is very slim, just 51 to 49. Uh, but they now, if they maintain party discipline, have control over the legislature. In some states, uh, over the past week and a half, there's been some chaos in terms of how voting works. Uh, this has re included everything from uh, bullying by uh, election observers to competing electoral slates to uh, different state officials disagreeing with each other and trying to compete with each other about who's in charge of which point. Uh, Georgia, Arizona, North Carolina saw this in particular. In Michigan, there was organized pressure to try to overturn the election. Uh, but Michigan's governor acted swiftly and put this down very, very quickly. Now, Trump and his allies are continuing to say the election uh, was won by them and that anything else is any competing narrative uh, is a theft. So they are calling themselves Stop the Steal 2.0, echoing his narrative from the 2020 election. 
Uh, we have some states which have uh, multiple slates of electors. That is, according to the Constitution, historical practice, normally a state assembles a team of electors who will go to the Electoral College to certify the election in January. But what's happening here is some states are seeing multiple elector slates put forward. Uh, the second slate is always done by uh, Trump allies. Uh, and another issue about this is that Republican officials in different states are publicly divided. Some of them are actually coming out and saying, yes, we think Trump has won the election. Others are saying, no, 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 clearly he lost. Don't, don't be divisive. Uh, we are seeing MAGA protests and MAGA eruptions uh, all over the U.S., uh, including threats to election officials, be they you know, local uh, county uh, officials or state officials. There have been three different attacks that we can attribute to MAGA across the country. Two of them have resulted in deaths. There are also a whole series of court cases uh, flooding the courts right now as people are suing and countersuing. Uh, in the world reaction, which people will often ask about, uh, right now, both Iran and the Houthi militia in Yemen have bombarded Israel with uh, drones and with missiles. Uh, Israel, in return or in exchange, has raided a whole series of Iranian sites, including oil sites in the Gulf and nuclear sites in Natanz. Uh, the Russian war in Ukraine continues to grind on the war of attrition, but right after the election, Russian President Putin reminded everyone that nuclear weapons are an option for the Russian state. Uh, across the U.S., we're seeing militias in certain key cities, uh, including Portland, including Dallas. Uh, there's also a spate of shootings that are hard to pin down the source of. They don't, uh, police don't necessarily come right out and say, this is drug related, it's political related related, but they really, really mysterious. And some people think they may be involved with the election. Uh, there are several plots against uh, both Donald Trump and against Kamala Harris uh, involving violence, involving bombs and guns. And those have been foiled uh, by the Secret Service as well as by other police forces. Uh, meanwhile, there are unofficial threats directed against immigrants and violence. Some immigrants are beaten on the streets. Uh, I want to turn to what this means for higher election, but let me just first ask everybody um, questions about how the scenario is unfolding. Again, we're about a week and a half after the election. Any questions about the different aspects of it and how it functions? Uh, if you're new to the forum, again, look at that white strip at the very bottom of the screen, and you can either type into the chat box or you can click raised hand to join me on stage, or you can type into the Q&A box. Uh, Lisa Durf asked, what about Florida votes? possibly throw into voting chaos to be impending and approaching hurricane. Not sure. Um, right now, uh, we do not have enough chaos to throw Florida um, into, into, we don't have enough meteorological chaos to throw uh, Florida into political chaos. Uh, right now, Florida ends up being pretty solid in Republican. It's a good question. <coughs> in uh, North Carolina, there were some issues getting people to uh, votes. <coughs> and, um, but yet those don't seem to have a really, really good question. Uh, Chris Jones says this sounds plausible. Eileen mentions a hurricane um, Helen caused widespread damage in South Carolina, Tennessee, North Carolina, Tennessee. Correct. Uh, Stephen Crawford asked about North Korean troops being deployed by Russia and Ukraine. Uh, right now, there are rumors about that, uh, but nothing is fully confirmed. Uh, Russia denies this. Pyongyang denies it. Um, it's not quite clear. And uh, Eileen shares some information about North Carolina voting. Thank you, Eileen. That's very, very helpful. Uh, Chris asked if there are North Korean troops in North Carolina. Um, that we have not yet monitored. Uh, and Amber points out in, in misinformation spread on Twitter. This is really, really great point. Um, there is a lot of misinformation going across social media. Uh, Twitter slash X is uh, one place where this is pretty visible thanks to the alignment between Twitter's owner, Elon Musk, and Donald Trump. Uh, but we're seeing this in everywhere. Uh, in, uh, TikTok, for example, uh, we're seeing a large amount of uh, claims and rumors about uh, different things. Nothing about North Korean trips in the US yet, but lots of other different things too. Chris, this is correct. Uh, Lisa, a bunch of people, including myself. Uh, Stephen Crawford says this brings me a great point about violence against minorities. Yes, um, specifically the, um, the last point here about threats and violence against immigrants. Um, again, think about what we've seen in Springfield, but also think about the long history of American resistance to immigration. 
and this can appear largely in symbolic forms, you know, flyers, uh, social media posts, but every so often in physical forms as well. Uh, Deborah adds, if Trump appears to be losing, or even if he wins, will it be churches who will be activated to march on Washington? Deborah, the second half of the scenario goes ahead two months. Hang on for that. Lisa Durf says that she ran from the bird door when the muskie took over. He is currently breaking federal law. Oh, I see. Sorry. I, I completely lost that. I was thinking about the politician muskie. I, I, yeah, completely lost that. Thank you. All right. Well, how does this impact higher education? What have we seen of that? Let me give you first a glimpse, and then we'll turn it over to you. Uh, so right now, there are sporadic clashes between campuses and their local community. This is mostly where you have a very progressive campus in a very conservative region. And of course, you can find examples of this across the United States. You can think of these as blue islands or blue oases, if you will. Uh, but the key thing is that on these campuses, that there's a lot of activism, perhaps a lot of celebration at the Harris victory, and then there is opposition from local community. Uh, and this can take the form of marches and counter marches, demonstrations, uh, shouting, hostile emails, uh, even physical threats. A second point happening is that Turning Point, the conservative academic organization, uh, has been using social media to dox faculty, staff, and students, uh, accusing of being traitors, of having fomented and supported the Harris victory, which in their lights would be terrible for the United States. So they're putting out private information about all these different academic people. Uh, third point is that uh, we have uh, ongoing encampments in favor of Palestinians in Gaza and elsewhere. Uh, and those protesters uh, say that Harris has won and they are opposed to her because she's continuing Biden's policy of supporting Israel. So the encampments persist. Uh, further, uh, there are conservative students who protest, and uh, they may be pro-life or they may be uh, anti-Ukraine, um, uh, but we're seeing these protests from here and there. Uh, we're also seeing Republican state leaders uh, calling for campuses to be controlled or corralled and advocating for new laws in order to control protesters to make sure that they don't, either they don't get out of line and the lights of these legislators, or that they are punished for having supported the Kamala Harris campaign. Uh, and so these range from everything from different ways to intervene in curricula, to trying to support campus centers or defund other campus centers, uh, or to uh, force different campuses to switch creditors. Uh, and lastly, several campuses have seen their digital infrastructure hacked. That is, they've seen their websites taken down, they've seen student data pride moose, uh, some of them have just been subject to DDoS attacks. Um, none of these have been signed as yet, uh, or the sources that haven't been identified, which is pretty typical for a lot of cyber war. Uh, but people will infer that this is conservatives attacking campuses for their perception of having supported Paris and Eric too. So I asked you for questions about this. Um, and already we seem to be heading over into the next step, which is how would you respond? So let's do both of these at once. Let me ask. So first, do you have any more questions about how the scenario might play out? Any details or implications? Anything that you'd like to unfold a bit further? Uh, and then how do you respond in the role that you have? So if you're an educational technologist, if you're a board member, how do you react at this point? Again, it's a week and a half after the election. Uh, we're giving you all the outlines. How do you react? So please feel free to use the chat box. If you'd like to say a bit more, uh, click the Q&A box. And if you'd like to join me on stage, please click the, uh, the, the right hand button. In fact, here, let me make this look a little less intimidating. Um, Lisa Durf asked a really, really great question, uh, which is how do we keep students safe? And so I just want to echo that question and say this is a question that's going to be a great deal of concern for campuses across the US, especially the ones that are enduring clashes in the local community. Uh, Amber points out um, 335.7 million users worldwide. Uh, Amber, I, I'm assuming you're talking about Twitter slash X. Uh, Lisa asks a couple of more really good questions. How do faculty deal with grades for students who skip classes to participate in encampments? 
That's a very good question. Uh, we may have some precedent in the past year, and we definitely have precedent going further back in the history of protests. Uh, if anyone would like to chime in with some examples of how to do that. Please also ask, will there be problems certifying the votes? Yes, there will be. That's coming up in the next part of the scenario. Now, Chris says he teaches online, so electronic or power disruptions would be problems. Very, very good point, Chris. I don't know if you saw the uh, recent um, National Student Clearinghouse Center's uh, enrollment update uh, came out this week. They said that primarily online institutions like Southern New Hampshire uh, have experienced a growth of 6% in enrollment, higher than almost anybody else. Uh, so this is a very, very important fact uh, that you know, all wholly online classes, if they are disrupted electronically, are in serious trouble. Uh, so you have to think about what kind of plan Bs people have for that. Now, Chris has a flip side, which is that he teaches DEI. So having a woman of color president would be fabulous. I think that's a great reaction. Um, that's one which I think we'll see across academia. Uh, Amber says that she works in a fully online campus at Washington State University, WSU Global. So we don't expect asynchronous disruptions, but I am anticipating potentially be asked to help if WS Global faculty have unseen needs arise. What are some of those needs, Amber, that might come out of the election and out of all the different attendant forces around this? And again, everybody, you can keep using the chat. Um, and by the way, I, I would like to extract the chat for a blog post. Uh, I will anonymize it like I usually do uh, and excerpt it. Um, but if you have any objections or if you'd like to do it, please let me know. Uh, Ember, what what kind of student needs? If you can just say a bit more. And again, if you want to join us on stage, I'd be glad to join you. Stephen Crawford says, it's interesting to see this experiment of asynchronous learning on election day for Ohio State. I could see this being extended. Uh, and he has a link. Thanks for that, Stephen. And the link is, oh, so good to see this. Thank you. So Ohio State, excuse me, the Ohio State University has an election day asynchronous learning pilot. Very, very cool. I'm not going to be able to read that right now, but I'll definitely read that later. Good catch. Uh, Hope Fitzgerald says, as a staff member and a supervisor of others, two things come to mind. First, make space, physical and mental, for folks to process together with or without me. Two, staff positions feel less secure than faculty and re-political activity. Very, very good points. Um, so I'm curious in answer to Hope's question, how would everybody like to preserve space for people to process all of these events. What kind of physical space? Would that be in the library, a student union, outside, for example, or would there be an online space, again, depending on your community? And then staff, yes, faculty, excuse me, staff usually lack the protections of tenure, only a few uh, staff members and a few institutions have that. Uh, staff are much less secure and they are equally subject to attacks. So think, for example, about uh, uh, a librarian who uh, collates a collection on uh, minoritized populations, uh, or think about a network administrator who is not who has said in public they would not like to turn over DACA student information to a potential Trump administration. Very very good point. Uh, Carrie Carrie adds that classroom conversations at our camp at her campus are likely to be sensitive, as many of our students lean more to the right politically. Political topics have already become more delicate over the past eight years. Good point, Gary. Good point. So uh, I was talking before about demonstrations and, uh, and marches and so on, but just having conversations will become more and more fraught. So how how would your campus support that? Is that a case where the provost, the academic dean, would take a role, or perhaps you have a teaching and learning center, that kind of thing? Uh, Amber points out that the stresses of the scenario causing learning and life disruptions. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Amber. And just hang on until we get to the second half of the scenario, um, because we'll see more of that. Thank you. Uh, Charles Finley asks, uh, given the scenario, or he, uh, he simply says, uh, it's certainly possible there would be a pivot to online for everyone's safety. We really proved how we could do that in COVID. And I think this is now a staple of a lot of classroom continuity or learning continuity uh, scenarios. In fact, we saw this with uh, in Springfield, Ohio, uh, where some institutions pivoted online uh, in order to avoid uh, th uh, threats to their physical safety. Uh, Chris Jones says that uh, we already have contingencies for hurricanes, 
So I might have to consider extensions and incompletes. Okay, that's a good answer to Lisa's question about how do you grade students this way. Uh, Lisa Durf puts out virtual world space as an alternative. Oh, as an alternative. Thank you. Uh, Doug Weinberg, he advances these comments. Amidst the chaos of distraction, institutions need to ensure that their ongoing accreditation processes happen in schedule. These cyclical things often get lost in the face of bigger or more immediate issues, leading to problems in the future. Absolutely, Doug. What a huge challenge for whomever is in charge of that, be it you know, a dean of assessment, an academic dean, someone who is conducting the uh, assessment uh, entirely by themselves uh, on their own just for this project. Think as well of the accreditors, um, both the accrediting agency, but also the uh, uh, accreditors that they bring in uh, just for this process from multiple institutions. Excellent question. Uh, Lisa asked a scenario question. How will this affect international students? Um, right now, we haven't seen much of a reaction. It's just been a week and a half. Hang on a few minutes and we'll see how that goes further. Uh, Amber responded, Charles saying, yes, she can see a pivot as campus protests resume. UCLA is facing a lawsuit from faculty and students on freedom of speech from the recent protest. Yeah, Amber, if, if I remember correctly, UCLA is getting it from both sides. There are Jewish students and I think faculty and staff who are saying that UCLA didn't do enough to protect them uh, during Gaza protests. And there are pro-Palestinian students, faculty and staff, who are saying uh, the same for them, that uh, uh, UCLA was biased against them. Uh, Philip Lingard, hello, Philip. Um, uh, he thinks that uh, that this whole event is going to reduce international involvement. Uh, Philip, I think you, uh, this is because of the political uncertainty. Uh, I think that's what you're anticipating, as well as the violence. Eileen uh, Frank uh, points out that uh, Florida's Governor DeSantis is looking forward to getting rid of accreditation. Yeah, he did that unusual thing of forcing Florida schools to recycle their accreditation or their accreditors, which is fascinating. Uh, Cameron Patterson asks uh, if teachers are uncomfortable opening up on their classrooms to these discussions, making students aware of where they can go to safely voice their concerns would be a good alternative. Good point, Cameron. Any recommendations for your institution or other ones where those kind of places might be? Uh, Hope Fitzgerald adds, standing up emergency remote learning would be doable. We've been through it, right? Yep. I wonder how that could affect a sense of community blowing open dialogue. Good question. So can you transfer these conversations? Can you do them online? I, obviously, technically, we can do them. Can we do them in a way that's safe and supportive and consistent with institutions at the submission? Excellent point, Hope. Uh, Stephen Crawford comes back to say the expenditure limit vote is compounding faculty staff concerns. The multiplier of national and Senate politics continue to accelerate burnout. Uh, good point. Good point. Last week, Stephen, we had um, uh, one participant say that they felt that it, dealing with the election would be like dealing with a hurricane. And you have to pivot and pivot again. It's simply exhausting. And Stephen shares another good link, uh, several good links. Stephen is winning the Library of the Day Award. Um, Amber, good, good. And uh, Lisa reminds us that reductions in enrollments uh, will further hurt institutions already hurting financially. Yes, quite, quite true. Quite true. Amber responds by noting the issues of immigration intensify, causing people to move. A reduction of staff is a media issue for higher education. Uh, this came interestingly last week when we were talking about responses to a Trump victory and the idea of moving out of the country came up or moving between states came up. And there's interesting questions about whether or not one could continue to keep working for a certain institution if you move between states or between nations. So I wonder if staff move, how that gets to play out here. Uh, Stephen, uh, I'm sorry, Chris Jones adds that doxing and swatting could make some more liberal faculty move overseas. Good point. Good point. Uh, even in a Harris victory. Uh, Stephen uh, continues that if the situation in Arizona deteriorates, faculty and staff may not be able to get to campuses due to curfews or traffic limitations. One college is about three miles from the Maricopa Elections Building. Oh, good point, Stephen. Uh, if that building, for example, is surrounded by police, uh, if there's a cordon sanitaire around it, that would be very, very difficult. All right. We're all thinking together now. This is great. We've been, we've been reacting, we've been processing this, we've come up with a whole set of good ideas. I'm really pleased by all the different options that you've all given. Now, let's advance the clock a little bit. Let's go forward in time a bit. 
and let's make it to January 2025. Let's make it late January 2025. How is the scenario advanced at this point? What does it look like? Well, in January, Trump refuses to concede still, even though the consensus is that Paris has won. But he does leave the White House on the very last day, quietly, without any ceremony or fuss. Uh, elsewhere across the U.S., some of the MAGA protests have sputtered out. Others continue uh, or escalate and have dug in. So you have MAGA encampments in different cities. There's also continued anti-immigrant action and activity. Um, And uh, this takes, again, takes the form of threats and as well as physical violence. Now, in reactions to this across the world, global markets in Europe, for example, and Japan uh, have been rising gently, um, not, not in ecstasy, but rising in some hope that this is a, you know, a good outcome for markets. Uh, in the Middle East, Israel and their opponents are firing missiles, drones, and airstrikes at each other. Uh, so we're seeing uh, strikes occur in Israel, in Iran, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon. Uh, meanwhile, China stages a huge military exercise around Taiwan, air, sea, and land. Um, you know, it looks like you know, preparation for a blockade or practice for one. Uh, during the inauguration, there is a kind of rerun of January 6th, 2021. Uh, what people that in the siege of the Capitol, uh, a large crowd descends on the Capitol to try and break up the election certification. Uh, this time, they're actually armed with guns, and there are hundreds of casualties as a result. There are similar riots or attacks or protests across the country, often aimed at state capitals, uh, particularly legislatures, but also governor's residences. Uh, there are shootings, there are bomb threats, and actual explosions. Nevertheless, at the end of this, the Royal College certifies a Harris victory. Now, the National Guard is out in force in several states, including Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina, and Texas, for different reasons in each state. Uh, the Texas Governor Abbott, for example, Lieutenant Governor, uh, says that he uh, would like to uh, preserve safety in the face of left-wing agitation. In Michigan, uh, Governor Whitmer uh, deploys the National Guard in order to forestall MAGA terrorism. Uh, Georgia and North Carolina, the National Guard is there to restore order, maintain order, and to make sure that the election process be used smoothly. Uh, there are further reports of uh, plots against Harris, against governors, against senators, against representatives. Uh, nothing violent attacks, again, no violent attacks against any of them so far. Um, and uh, J.D. Vance uh, has refused to concede. Uh, and he is starting to say that we need to think about 2028 and how they can have a Republican victory there. Now, uh, as Harris becomes president, she is, after she is sworn in, she takes several executive actions uh, that are very straightforward. One of them is, and these are based, by the way, if you look on your screen, the very bottom left corner, you'll see a kind of lozenge shape. Uh, that takes you to the PDF, which is the official Harris campaign platform that they hope to accomplish. Um, and that includes uh, starting an industrial policy, which she has called America Forward, for high technology fields, so bioinformatics, for AI, for robots, for example. The second is that there is already currently a national artificial intelligence research resource. And one of these uh, executive orders amplifies that and expands it. Uh, she also directs the Department of the Treasury to extend the child tax credit that had lapsed under the Biden administration. And she also orders the creation of a task force in order to determine price gouging, where it is and how it works. Uh, Democrats introduce a series of bills into Congress. Uh, one of them is to provide for a housing start payment, uh, which would give anybody who wants to buy a house for the first time up to $25,000 to purchase that for a down payment. There's also a parallel bill which would give tax credits to builders who want to build more housing and add to the housing stock. Uh, another bill would ban price gouging, although language of that is a little bit abstract. There's another bill that would expand the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, it says IRA, that's what we're referring to, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there's another bill which would guarantee abortion rights to all citizens, all residents of the United States, uh, federally and nationally. 
Now, there are a few more executive orders that impact higher education directly. But before I get to those, before I get to that, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts and questions about how the uh, uh, how this is actually proceeding. Uh, one question is, um, why is Trump in the White House in this scenario? Oh, good point. That is a mistake. Yes, that is an error. Um, he uh, basically just uh, did. So you can forget that point um, by him leaving the White House. Thank you. Um, we have comments about uh, immigration anxiety causing people to move. Um, and we're also seeing that uh, universities that religiously affiliated make spaces for all. Good call, Roxanne. Very, very good. Uh, Lisa Durf says that she expects pre-K through 12 will go online as well, which would affect students who need to do classroom observations and field experiences. That's harder to arrange. It can be done, but it's harder to arrange. Good point, Lisa. Uh, Cameron Patterson. Uh, so the advising counseling services would be what comes to mind, uh, again, for supporting students. At some schools, the students will have a specific advisory counselor. They'll hopefully have a connection to make with those conversations and concerns. Cameron, do you see any campuses pointing to AI uh, for a role in that kind of conversation? Uh, Roxanne says inviting student families, too. Good point, Roxanne. Lisa, we, we are kind of doing a high octane, high speed distributed think tank right now. Yes. Uh, Eileen Frank uh, cites a report uh, from uh, last month saying that 40% of faculty in uh, Florida say they've applied to other states for jobs. Wow. Who wins the presidential election might not change that. True. If I can paraphrase in order of saying, um, DeSantis is very close and Harris is farther away. Thanks, Steve, for that question, uh, and Philip as well, and Chris. Um, Roxanne, um, she mandates a draft. Do you mean that Kamala Harris as president mandates a military draft? Patricia, so the current administration will need to designate the time periods of national security event in order to ensure the DC area is secure leading up to the inauguration. Patricia, in fact, that's what happens. That's why the siege of the Capitol um, is only two days and why it ends with a successful uh, completion of the Royal College certification, because it is much more uh, defended, much more thoroughly militarized than before. Uh, Amber raises an alternative idea. Um, Trump is put into jail for felony charges by the Biden administration. Um, I That would be interesting, Amber, although we may have to wait for that a few more months for the Harris administration to do it, for the legal machinery to proceed. Stephen asks for a far as apocalypse for the East Coast in the January. Odds are low, but global weirding is a thing. And uh, uh, Philip Lingard says, near scenario, Mike Johnson remains speaker, so Harris cannot become president. Um, this is a good question, uh, but... Uh, Speaker Johnson is not willing to go against the Electoral College. Uh, and here he does certify. He does uh, certify Harris. Uh, Chris Jones points out that this is a divided government. So we have a Democratic president, we have a Republican House and uh, Senate. So no legislation will move forward and government shutdown seems likely. Good point. Good thing to foresee. Uh, Cameron says, I hadn't thought of students turning to AI as an alternative for advising and counseling. I believe students who have concerns would really want a program, a person listening to them rather than a program. Maybe so. I mean, I, I can see the advantage, certainly, but I wonder about the students who don't have access to that. institutions, for example, that are not fully staffed, for some of the reasons we've been talking about. Uh, Hope asks this question How can we leverage our campus resources, space, people, funds, et cetera, to support our students, faculty, and local communities, especially the most vulnerable? Uh, that's that's, I think, really one of the questions that we have. And if, if we scroll up the chat a bit, Hope, a few people have given some solutions to this. Um, one is uh, for, uh, to bring in students' families. So again, some students are parents, some students have parents who are both, um, and partners and so forth, and children, and they can bring them in on campus. That's one, that's one response. Um, think about that as an extended version of supporting a whole person. Uh, we also think about leveraging counselors. Uh, to support that, and perhaps AI for that. Well, let me take this think tank a little further here. So we've set up the Harris administration. Uh, we set up uh, its first actions. Now its actions in terms of higher education. So one of them is to end degree requirements for 1 million federal jobs. 
So right now, if you'd like to apply for various jobs in different branches of government, be it the Postal Service or the Department of Transportation, jobs which previously required an associate's, bachelor's, master's, and so on degree no longer require those. Uh, so this is an act against the so-called paper ceiling. So someone with a high school diploma and or work experience can now apply. A second executive order expands training support um, from the uh, Department of Labor for specific grants. And these are aimed at high technology fields uh, for training in automation, for training in bioinformatics and other advanced uh, biotechnology. A third is uh, issuing debt relief through the Department of Education aimed at minority students. So specifically black and Hispanic as well as indigenous students who have statistically uh, higher debt loads than everybody else. Uh, meanwhile, in this process, uh, Biden's uh, Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, steps down. Uh, so that position is open. Uh, academia, oh, sorry, there are a couple of comments here in the chat. Uh, Stephen Crawford says, from a community college point of view, Harris win uh, means more status quo for us. The end of degree requirements might mean an acceleration of micro credentials and certificates. Uh, two very good points. So, first, to some extent, you might see the status quo persist. Uh, and so, the continuity from Biden to Harris. And the second is that if, if the macro certificates, if you will, the associate's degree, bachelor's degree, uh, are less in demand than maybe institutions pay its off in smaller degrees. Uh, Stephen, I would point you to the National Student Clearinghouse's uh, data this week. Uh, the report included uh, the comment that of all, all, of all um, uh, certifications that we award, that uh, certificates were by far more popular than any other. Lisa is happy to see Cardinal go. Um, and uh, Chris Jones asked if a White House strategic foresight czar and agency is established. Not yet. Uh, I would, of course, like to see that. I'd like to see that very much. In fact, if you haven't seen this, by the way, here, let me just put this up on stage. Um, Chris asked this as a, uh, as a question, so in the Q&A box. Uh, now, some nations have had different forms of foresight positions. Uh, the country of Wales, for example, the country of Israel. European Commission, the kind of executive arm of the European Union, has had several different foresight jobs in the past. And the United States, for a few years, had a really, really interesting office called the Office of Technology Assessment, which did some of that work. And it was uh, abolished in 1993, uh, excuse me, 1995. Um, good point. Good question. Now, some of the reactions that I can give you to help you know, show how this might play out one is of relief. Uh, majority of academics tend to uh, be Democrats, um, and many of them were very frightened of a Trump victory and agreed a Harris victory with delight, um, uh, at the very least with relief. There are concerns about how the Higher Education Act might be renewed, given the divided uh, division between the Democratic White House and the Republican House and Senate. Uh, again, Gaza protests continue. Uh, so Gaza protesters say that they see Harris backing the Biden administration's policy towards Israel and Palestinians, which they abhor, and so they continue to protest. Uh, we also see different colleges and universities negotiating with their state governments. Remember, right after the election, a bunch of state governments started pushing new laws and regulations to try to corral or punish higher education. So we're seeing public and private institutions, especially the presidents, uh, and their partnership teams going out to negotiate with state governments to try to tamp those down or alter them or just block them straight up. Uh, also, uh, we're seeing a lot of nonprofit higher education, that's the clear majority of higher education, uh, hoping that the Harris administration will crack down on for profit colleges and universities, uh, much like President Obama did in his second term, because they see them as uh, of too low, dangerously low quality and they'd like to uh, preserve, they'd like to recommend those students take classes for the nonprofits. So more questions and more questions. And also, how do you respond now? You know, it's late January, 2025. We're coming up on February. How do you respond to this? Uh, Amber says, the election is decided by people under 30. Are the young society the reason to allow them to participate more fully in society and politics? Wonderful, Amber. That's a great idea. Just imagine people in you know, their teens and 20s who really take a step up and are able to Play a major political role. Generation Z for the win. 
me make sure I've got everybody's comments and questions here. I think I do. So how does this play out for you though? We have uh, President Harris installed. She's taken a whole series of actions already, both executive actions uh, through the federal administration, as well as kicking off congressional actions, which may or may not pan out. Uh, we've had some tastes, some samples of higher education responses. How, do you, how does this impact you in your position or a position you'd like to have next year? Uh, Chris Jones says, for profits like Walden uh, serve predominantly minority students. So those communities could be impacted. Yes, yes. And we know from the uh, collapse, the temporary collapse of for profit sector in the 2010s that those students don't shift to other sectors of higher education. They just step out completely uh, out of higher education. Uh, Lisa Durf adds that local unrest, regardless of election outcome, local unrest is dangerous to all of us. Quite true. So Lisa, how do colleges and universities handle that? How do they protect their student body as well as faculty and staff? Joellen Parker mentions this, institutional finances are devastating. Some marginal institutions can't fund the second semester. So right away, we have this problem of a whole bunch of colleges heading over the brink. So we might expect to see waves of cuts or attempts at mergers or institutional closures. She goes on to say, divided boards tangle over institutional reactions. Can you think about this? You know, the, for, a, for a private institution, and private institutions are about one third of higher education. Uh, think as well about the regions that are in charge of public institutions. Uh, the boards are going to be areas of disagreement. Uh, where some of them would like to, for example, welcome Harris and open arms. Some prefer institution neutrality. Some of them would like to aggressively reach out to the community. Some would prefer to hold back. Some want to expand supporting students, taking care of them. Others don't want to do so much of that for pecuniary reasons. Uh, excellent, excellent points, Joel. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, another comment coming in. Uh, this is one from uh, from Europe, from our good friend Phil Lingard in the country in Aldo Malta. And he says this, uh, two parts. Everyone I speak to across Europe is in a state of total, near or total or actual breakdown with worry over the U.S. election. Are folks in the U.S. in a similar state of extreme stress? Uh, he goes on. Oops, excuse me. Okay, I just clicked the right button. He says, as a former political candidate and party administrator, my reading is Harris has got this one with a trifecta. Uh, Philip, by trifecta, are you referring to also winning the House and Senate? Um, uh, Phil, my sense in the U.S. is... And I, this is just my own sense from doing my research into this. And please, everybody else, feel free to, to, to chime in. I think a lot of Americans are burned out on the election. You know, if, you, if you look at polling, for example, it's stayed pretty consistent for several months. I think a lot of Americans feel bombarded. If they live in uh, battleground states, they're constantly getting flyers and ads of all kinds. Uh, I think a lot of Americans have tuned out. Uh, I think quite a few Americans are very frightened. Uh, both Trump and her supporters are frightened by what the opposition might do. Uh, and I think some people are just very excited as well about the, po about the possibilities if their side wins. Um, but yeah, so I would see a divide in that respect. Um, if anyone in the chat wants to say more, uh, please uh, please feel free based on your own experience. Uh, Lisa doesn't like polls. Um, Phil, you're getting people who agree with you and see this as being um, uh, a fraud issue here. But note that this is a relatively small group. We've got a couple of dozen folks here. Um, we're not getting the full, you know, dozens and dozens or hundreds that we that we can get sometimes. Uh, I think in in many ways we're uh, you know we're really facing um, that kind of divide over over concern versus uh, versus burnout. Uh, Daisy, hello, Daisy. Um, if social media is a thing around kids today, they would not mind AI unless they've had the opportunity to organize and manage certain problems experienced over the internet. That creates an equal opportunity competition issue. 
good point, Daisy. I, I think millennial generation Z, um, you know, already have had experience with uh, AI um, in some ways through, through Instagram and through gaming. So for some of them, that won't be the big jump. Um, uh, Carrie, hello, Carrie, says that she's afraid that our university will still feel stifled by state legislation who has all but outlawed DEI initiatives. Efforts to offer services for our most vulnerable students is tricky to the fear of our state government. Carrie, if you could say which state that is, I'd, I'd appreciate it. If you can't, I, I understand. But this is a this is an important thing. We're talking about the federal election, and I've, I've only I've really been focused on the House and uh, the White House and the, uh, and the Senate and the House of Representatives. But I haven't said too much about state governments, but state governments that persist, uh, or state governments that flip to Republican might continue to do this. You know, uh, mid, trying to mitigate or go against or uproot the uh, programs. Uh, excellent point, Carrie. Uh, Chris Jones says that civil unrest will drive more courses and programs online. Um, yeah, I think that I think we'll see versions of what happened in Springfield last month happening across the U.S. Um, Amber uh, Strokes points out that students in college are leaders, sorry students in college leaders are getting people to register to vote in the under thirty group. They stayed in school after getting their degrees or the next four years to take political offices because they could finally see themselves in Harris and Waltz. Wow, Amber, nice projection forward. The whole new generation of leaders reminds me of the uh, Watergate babies back in the 1970s. Uh, Lisa Durf asks if institutions would arm campus police and surround the campus. Both of those options are on the table, I think. Uh, arming police if they're not already armed um, and then putting up some kind of barrier around the campus to protect them. Um, I think that last part is really tricky to do, um, but it might be merited by dangerous situations. Uh, Daita, hello, Daita. I'm glad you could make it for both of these weeks. Uh, she says, for her role in professional community, I hope the Higher Ed Sustainability Act will gain traction. Yeah, let's hear that. I'd really like to hear it. Um, Amber points out that 100% uh, U.S. feeling stress of elections. Yes, yes. Uh, Danita points out a few resources that will share with me regarding the stress of these elections uh, and puts up a link. Um, we'll take a look at that, Danita. Thank you. Um, Wesson adds that they are burned out and anxious. I've gotten 50 political text messages in the past three days. Oh, man. Well, that's one of the battleground states, right? I mean, uh, this past couple of weeks, I've traveled a bit across the U.S. And it's interesting, whenever I'm in a battleground state, I've been getting a sample of that. Uh, I live in Virginia. Uh, thanks for that link to uh, Ariel Huffington. And another one, elections, very good stuff. Uh, Patricia says that a uh, friend in Europe is concerned if Trump wins, their lives will be precarious if Trump will allow Putin to ravage Ukraine and to seek to invade Poland and potentially Finland on his way across Europe. Now, I think last week we didn't talk about that often enough, Patricia. Um, well, we, uh, last week's scenario was one that posited a Trump victory. Um, and Kerry's in Missouri. Ah, I understand, Kerry. Yeah, I understand. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Chris says that he teaches DEI subjects, but his university does not use that language anymore. They use social justice and racial equity. Their semantics will likely change. Um, yeah, my sense is, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that New Hampshire keeps defunding uh, public universities. And yours is private, I believe. Um, but I, I don't believe it's been a, a, a deep red state in the culture war sense. But please correct me if I'm wrong, if, I, if I've missed that. Um, Joellen uh, gives us this thought. The decisions campuses make to shape their enrollment and fundraising for years to come, potentially accelerating the division of higher ed market into red and blue institutions. Uh, we could definitely, so let's just take these into two parts. Uh, one thing is to, for everyone to think about what this means for institutional finances. So how many, how many institutions, for example, that are publicly funded to some degree, are willing to risk that state funding uh, by resisting state laws uh, or trying to respond to them. Uh, how many institutions uh, have that rely on private funding, especially big donors, are going to have to respond to donors who have political agenda? Uh, how can a how can a president and C-suite uh, staff, how can administration, how can they make a decision that preserves? their enrollments so that their revenue keeps coming in so they can keep doing their business, they keep performing their mission. Um, and the second part is, it'd be really interesting to see um, how red and blue higher education, would that map evenly onto uh, different states? I would, get, I would suppose not. 
I was approached, you know, you would go to say Deep Red, Texas, and then uh, in the city of Austin, you would see various progressive institutions. Perhaps we'll see that. Uh, perhaps we'll see something like a progressive state, such as California or New York, having conservative institutions in rural areas throughout that. Uh, maybe this becomes a new ranking uh, way where people are able to rank institutions based on where they are politically. Uh, friends, we've only got about uh, two minutes left, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to, to respond and think about this. So let me just take you a little further and to, to get a little bit meta. What was this like? Let me just kind of bring you back to the present day. Right? You know, it's, it's actually October 24th, 2024. The election hasn't been decided. We haven't had these outbreaks of unrest. We haven't had it. Harris or Trump administration sworn in. What was this experience like? Was this useful for you? Was this frightening or exciting? Um, what did you get from this? How has this helped you think and plan uh, for what you are doing in your own work? And again, you, everyone seems comfortable in the chat box. That's fine. If you'd like to join me on stage, just click the raise hand button. You know, or if you want to type in a Q&A box question, please, please do that. What do you think about this, this scenario exercise? Lisa Nerf points out unsettling consequences. Indeed. I mean, this is, friends, this is part of the futurist job is we have to look ahead and see the full range of possibilities. I often joke from dystopia to utopia. And, and we have to make people aware of what some of the serious possibilities are so they can plan and think about them ahead of time. Chris Jones said the Harris scenario is more concerning than Trump's. Why is that, Chris? Say more. Charles says uh, each week was stressful by exposing areas of concern I hadn't thought about before. I'm I'm sorry to bring the stress, but I'm I'm glad that we've we've added more ideas, Charles. Oakland Guard says it's disturbing, especially today. Uh, Philip, I actually had a disturbing element, and it didn't appear in this slideshow. I think I managed to upload the previous version, but uh, I had a slight foreign policy uh, adjustment, which was that in her first week of office that Harris uh, orders bombing of Houthi sites in Yemen and uh, some U.S. crews are shot down, um, which is a very, very plausible outcome um, or a very plausible event, and that might be uh, concerning as well. Um, Chris Jones says that he expects a lot of crap from a Trump win, but the civil discord will not go away. That's one of the things I wanted to point out about these scenarios. I, I hope to explore that was to was to show that we have a very divided society, and this election it doesn't tip us into civil war, but does bring out you know it kind of puts a lot of adrenaline into the body politic, and we might see some uh, some reactions that are uh, quite disturbing. Uh, Kerry says, before this experience, I imagine I'd feel a great sense of relief from the Harris victory. I realize now there will simply be new worries, but not as frightening as alternatives. Well, that's a good summary, Kerry. Uh, I hope you can I hope you can feel that sense of relief as well and hold on to that. Uh, Joan says that it could be a party realignment, but maybe more significant. Uh, I'm not an Americanist nor a political scientist, but if, if I could just quickly, Chris, if I'm reading you correctly, referring to the idea that every generation or so we have a massive realignment of where Americans vote with which uh, political parties. So if I believe it's Amber's uh, idea that we have more young people voting, we might see something uh, very different, it might be a kind of tectonic shift. Thank you. Um, friends, I, I have to say that we have somehow raced through, not just into 2025, but into three o'clock Eastern time October 24th. Um, we're going we're gonna to have to wrap things up. Um, I do want to thank all of you for the great comments, the great thoughts. This is not an easy one to work through, and you did brilliantly. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all of your participation, everything you gave. Um, I'm hoping to, uh, to post this as soon as I can. Uh, the recording, hopefully within two days, then hopefully a blog post uh, with extracts from, from all of this. Um, last thoughts, let's see, uh, Chris Jones pointed out, for example, the Republican Party is very different from the Reagan era. Great example, great example. 
Uh, Stephen Crawford says, I'm glad I'm the only one to consider the days and weeks following this election being unsettled. I'm not sure people are considering it. Stephen, it's a possibility. And that's one of the things I wanted to accomplish here. Um, Bill Blingard says 10% of GOP voting Harris. <laughs> that's one way. Uh, and that's clearly a strategic priority for us to reach out to the GOP. Uh, Stephen Crawford says, uh, also thinking about if people are preparing how to respond to protect our campuses. That was one of the one of the goals I wanted from this session. Uh, Amber says, I think young people will make the difference when things go sideways. They're going to push for unity. I like your thinking, Amber. And Chris had great fun. Excellent. Well, thank you. Listen, if you want to keep talking about this, you want to keep hashing out what a Harris win might look like, um, here, you can find me on all the socials. I'd love to hear from you on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky, and of course, my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including our previous scenarios, as well as some of our more politically themed events, when we've hosted, for example, the Undersecretary for Higher Education, the United States government, or a gubernatorial candidate, just go to our, our archive, tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Go look ahead to our other sessions as we invite more guests, and we have everything from what the right to learn is, to how to reform grading, to what educability might be, to the future of libraries. The forum website has all that information, forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again uh, for thinking together with me. I hope all of you are safe and sound. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope you're enjoying autumn as the leaves turn, as the temperature slowly drops. Um, thank you again. Please be safe and take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.